Thank you very much. Uh, my object here is to tell you something different about Thomas Nelson, Jr., my fourth great grandfather. I think it's very important to know how he was raised. Without telling how he was raised, you really don't get the foundation of who he was. So I'm going to, my wife will do this if I go too long, so you know how that is. <laughs> so is, and, and I'm referring to this headstone back here, the stone, and that's, that's his grandfather, who was born in Penrith, Cumberland, England in 1677. He passed away when, I'll call it Governor Nelson, uh, was just seven years old. So the governor did not get to know his grandfather very well, just seven years old. But what's really interesting about Scotch Thomas Nelson, they say because he was near Scotland, but I don't know if that's true, is that he was 19 years old and he became a boatswain on a ship and came this direction. Getting, and he was the son of Hugh and Sarah Nelson who were a cloth, cloth merchant. And he had some money eventually, some, a little bit of inheritance and some other money. And he came over here and three trips. Imagine a 19 year old sailing this way. So he takes three trips. Uh, his fourth trip was in 1705 and he really likes Yorktown. He's going to settle here. So he arrives here and in just five years he appointed to the York County Court. His wife, Margaret Reed, whose portrait is in the Nelson House, uh, ties him into the Nicholas Mardio, the founder of Yorktown. He's a French Huguenot Indian fighter, and he's buried right back here. He's also tied into George Washington through this connection. This marriage has three children, William, Thomas, and Mary. We'll be speaking more about William. Margaret Reed dies, and he marries Francis Morris Tucker, a widow, and they have one child. What's great about his grandfather is that he accumulates a great amount of work, work, work wealth. Think of this. Before, before he dies, he has 6,000 acres. Tobacco is his main product. He has 14 lots, most of them here in Yorktown. And by the way, if you have five, a, a half acre lot here in Yorktown, you are required within one year to have a structure on it or you forfeit to the town trustees everything on that lot. You don't get reimbursed. So he's built a lot. He, of course, tobacco's his crop. He builds a, a ferry, a mill, wharfs, warehouses, a nice pub over here, Swan Tavern, which is that's not the original. Uh, he builds and builds and builds till he has a great deal of wealth. He even builds the Nelson House out of remnants of ships and bricks that came over his ballast from the Severn Valley near London. He does that because the tax on new bricks and new wood is not terribly good for you. So he's doing everything to build his house. And by the way, his son William is said to be one year old and helping to lay the cornerstone of the, the Nelson House you see up the street. I don't know how much he lifted bricks, but one year old. But say he was, that was in the early papers said that with the house being about 1715. So when he dies, uh, his son William and Thomas, are before he dies, he gets shipped over to England. William's only 11 years old for his education. And what a grand education he had. There were no schools around for them to go to. So you had to be pretty wealthy to send your children over there. So they become quite educated. Uh, Thomas, who's buried somewhere in here, there's no headstone, uh, becomes appointed by Governor Goose to be Deputy Secretary of the House of Burgesses. That hints Thomas, this is called Secretary Nelson. William becomes eventually President of the House of Burgesses and will be called President Nelson. What's good about Thomas is he's, he gets to collect all the, the money from marriages, from uh, he's points county clerks, does everything. He has about a thousand pound uh, annual income. Now, when uh, Scotch Thomas dies, that stone there on the top and on the sides it had to be shipped in from London. Recently, the clean stone shows the name of the company 
that had made this stone. And if you look at Williams, the stone seems similar, so I'm surmising that that stone also came from London. It took a while to get here. And you'll also notice that there's a, a stone on top of it that's kind of strange, wasn't it? They say that Helen Keller came over because the stone was so deteriorated they couldn't see what was written on it, so she felt what it was and determined what the description was. And so hence they made a stone on top to apply to it so you could see what it said. But William was a, he was a strict, a strict father. And he made sure, and he really made sure that Thomas, after he was born, uh, got the right education. He hired a tutor to teach him here because there weren't any schools for Thomas to go to. But across the river at Peasley, there was a, a priest named William Yates who eventually be, is, becomes the root parish rector. But at the time, he was at Abington. Taught him really subjects like Latin and things like that that you probably wouldn't be very interested in taking. That. But there were a lot of interesting uh, subjects he talked to. When he got done there, his father said, it's time for you to go to England. So Thomas uh, gets shipped off to England when he was uh, 14, I believe. And he goes over there, and his father's still watching after him. He knows people here and there to put him in the right place. So he goes to a place called Peasley, uh, not Peasley, but Hackney, a village of Hackney. And he has somebody called Newcomb who became a doctorate in law at Cambridge. And so he taught Thomas over there outside of London. And when that was done, William had friends over uh, over that way and said, hey, let's put him with uh, Bellaby Portis. Billy Portis had just been ordained. And it was a one-on-one -on -one relationship at Cambridge, which is Christ College there. I've actually said in the pew at the church there. So he gets that education. I mean, he's learning everything. His father's saying, I want him to know about agriculture. I want him to know business. I want him everything, Latin again and, and other things. So he's really, and he said, watch after my son Tom because he has a tendency to deviate. So anyway, he does. And he, Thomas gains a lot of weight. He's a very large man. He, he gains a lot of weight over there because there was a nearby pub and I found that interesting for himself. But anyway. He finishes all his, uh, he's almost over there eight years, and he finishes his education. And so, next thing you know, his father, who has been corresponding, making sure he's all right, says, it's time for you to come home. But he did not get a degree when he came home. So, to show you how much he's paying attention, he knew in about three months who was going to be on the next ship. So he said, you can't go on that ship, because I know who's on it, and it's a bad influence for you. So, Thomas has to wait another couple of months to catch the next ship over. And he can't even get to Yorktown. He has to go to New York to get back. So, you know, they had 10, ten of his compatriots over there. He's the only one that wasn't a Tory in the end. All the rest. So he wasn't influenced that one. So he comes back through New York, and things begin to happen. Uh, he's, his father can tell he's had a great education. His mind is better. He's doing much better. He's not quite up to the speed of his father, William. But he has to take on a lot of responsibility. His father's had 30,000 acres and multiple farms and all the stuff that he inherited from Scotch Top. He has a lot of business to tend to. And he'd like to push it off some on the time so he gives him a couple plantations to work with and whatnot. But when a year after Thomas gets back, he sees this nice-looking young lady named Lucy Grimes, the daughter of Philip Grimes, and they're into wealth. She is very educated. She actually attended Peasley across the river. So in that relationship, it was wonderful. She was good at the harpsichord, dancing. You know, she was really a fine woman. And eventually, she gives birth to 13 children. Two young boys died in infancy, but the 11 remained. Six young men, five in a row that were born. So they say the legacy of the Nelsons would never disappear. And I'm here to prove that. But, but anyway... So, she was a disciplinarian. She was a religious woman. She locked herself in that house, in the room, for one hour a day reading the Bible. The family was considered very religious, being on the vestry here and, and whatnot in this particular in this church. They say before he even got here, he was appointed clerk of the court, and that's what his father's influence in his, his uncle. He graduated, and I'm going to, there's a ton of information about Thomas Nelson, but I'm going to move along to the rest of the story. He goes through all the entanglement with all the, 
the non-representation from Britain and, and our government here get very upset until at, uh, in Richmond, when Patrick Henry gives this famous speech, behind him was sitting Thomas Nelson, and he shouts out, if we are attacked, basically something of this sort, I will not wait for orders. I will not wait for orders at all. I will raise up a militia, and I will send them back into the city. Now, that's considered hot-headed. And so he didn't make it the First Continental Congress, as well as some of his other compatriots, because they considered him a little bit too rough. Uh, but when the House of Burgesses, which now you have Scotch Thomas Nelson, William Nelson, Secretary Nelson, and that, excuse me, not the, William Nelson, and Thomas Nelson gets on to that House of Burgesses. So now we have a William, a Thomas, and a Thomas. So the hence you see the junior added to Thomas Nelson Jr. because they, didn't, they couldn't they have to differentiate between the signatures. So a couple scenes you'll note. Uh, Thomas Nelson is a brigadier general when Benedict Arnold's coming up the James River. You see that the ships are coming up. He's going to attack Williamsburg. And guess who's in the woods off Jamestown? Gov uh, brigadier General Thomas Nelson with several hundred troops. And he probably, there, there were no trees in this village, by the way, virtually, when this was all happening, because it all been chopped down. But along the river, there were trees and all that. They noted that this militia was over there, so an emissary was put on a small boat to bring him over to the uh, shore, and he steps up, approaches General Nelson, and says, uh, I have a note here, it said EA or something on it, and it said, you are asked to surrender. You have no choice. We are coming ashore, and basically, you just got to surrender. So General Nelson looks at that and says, is this VA a, the traitor Brit, uh, Benedict Arnold? I guess the guy was asking affirmatively. He says, well, would you inform Benedict Arnold that if he steps ashore here, I will personally hang him by his heels. Well, there was a, there was a bird hunter out there and he set off around nearby. And I don't know if that exactly scared him, but you know, Benedict Arnold decided not to attack Williamsburg. He went on up to the new capital of Richmond and uh, destroyed it, basically, uh, leaving it. So I don't know if General Nelson was the influence or the bird hunter, but that, that was a, a scene that happened. You go on, and another scene you've all heard about it is Boston Harbor in 1774. Thomas Nelson had great support from the community. When they were under siege, the, the port was blocked. They sent oodles of food and funds and everything up there to help the poor Bostonians. And would you know, six months later, the ship Virginia showed up here when it wasn't supposed to with two boxes of tea. The Captain Estes there was on the ship and he said, I'm just doing what I was told to do, to bring the tea here. They had to discuss whether they should burn the ship that was anchored in the harbor. Now, Thomas Nelson said, not, we're not going to hurt Captain Estes or burn his ship. I'm going to personally remove the two Test, uh, two chests of tea, and he threw them into the water, and that was our Boston Tea Party here. But it was, it was important because you weren't supposed to have that tea on board. We're going to skip right along now to the situation where there's a lot of information. One of his daughters, Susanna, wrote a 30-page memo about the about Lucy and all that. It gives descriptions of his death and everything about how the strict disciplinarian there was in the family and all that. And, he, and certainly he was disciplined. But when he dies, or close to death, there was a little servant girl in the room. He didn't die here, he died in Hanover. And uh, she was behind the... Seriously, yeah. She was crying. She was crying behind the curtain as, as Lucy gave Thomas his papers and she knew he was going to die. He had asthma and he, and he died. And to see the little girl crying because of the family was, everybody was touched by him. So what happened, let's go, we're moving right along. He dies at a very young age, 1789, January the 4th. I think he was reinterred here because they hid his body at first so it wouldn't be held for ransom because they owed a tremendous amount of money. Let's talk about what happens next. The budget, so a lot of money, a huge amount of money. He was the fifth richest signer of the Declaration of Independence. I mean, he had a lot of money and property. He, he gave it off, he gave it off his food, soldiers, and everything. And so, in the Virginia Assembly of 1822, he said, let's reimburse, this. actually my third grandfather, Hugh, and the family for all the money lost. And it just sort of died away. 1831, 
state auditors reported against us, they, they could not provide the money to reimburse the families. The family just was not reimbursed. In 1852, there, there was passed uh, a motion by the Virginia Senate to put a tombstone here. Guess what? Never happened. The, when the monument down the road that you see was put up, somebody suggested buying the Nelson House in the state to put, make, it as a, make it as a place for the uh, superintendent of the state to monitor 5,000. Some years later, they said 10,000. Never happened. Nothing's happened. The Colonial Dames of America in 1903 noted the unmarked grave of Thomas Nelson, but they said, hey, let's move Lucy here. Let's bring her in, into town. That never happened. Uh, Lucy's been, would have been passed for like oh, 40 years or something, and she's buried uh, up in Hanover. The, uh, in 1909, guess what happens? That's a, in the 17th, the press reports that Thomas Nelson Day is going to occur the next day. So they're actually naming the day before the 19th. And there'll be a lot of reunion of uh, members of the family at that one. And it would be nice if they would contribute to the grave, to the stone. Well, I don't, they must not have contributed too much because it didn't happen. Now, we get information that in 1915, there was not a stone here. But guess what happens in 1917? World War I is happening. All over the country, there's advertising for bonds. And guess what they're saying? The words, he gave all for liberty. And if you read that stone, you will see that. They are referring... <laughs> to the stone here that he gave off for liberty. Liberty. It's in lots and lots and lots of newspapers. So we date the stone had to have been here in mid in mid 1917. In preparation for the 200th anniversary of the Battle of Yorktown, the Park Service, which has been created in 1931, buys the property all around the Nelson House, which belongs to a Captain Glow. They go to restoring it and hope for opening on October 19th, 1981. And if you were here, you would have been able to go through it. They had a small play. So each October 19th, we do commemorate Yorktown battle, but we also commemorate the life of Thomas Nelson Jr. because he gave all for liberty. Thank you.